Hi, everybody. We're kicking off to grab a drink, take a seat. Everybody following us on the live stream, welcome. Uh, this is the Cloud Native Computing Switzerland Meetup. First time live and physical again. So, upside, you have to uh, drown sound, you have to travel here. Upside, there's pizza and beer. Yay! Awesome. So, my name is Arno from Vision, the Cloud Native DevOps company. Uh, me and Adrian have the pleasure to organize this meetup together with you and for you, of course. Um, we have uh, three wonderful speakers today. Um, uh, first, we have a short introduction. Um, I'm also going to present Ergon, sponsor of uh, tonight's uh, food and beverage and location. Um, then we have Christian from SUSE. Uh, unfortunately, um, he's a little sick, so he couldn't join us here today, but in, um, he's going to have his talk uh, remotely. Um, then we have Matush from Red Hat here um, to have his talk here live on stage. And then we have Gloria and Fabian from Chaos um, uh, also here uh, live on stage tonight. Perfect. Um, if you have any questions or need something, uh, talk to me uh, or Daniel. Um, if there's anything you have ideas for uh, talks to have on the next meetup, um, if you are looking forward to um, uh, sponsoring uh, or you've, if you work in a company that wants to sponsor one of the next meetups, uh, please do reach out to us or through a web form on the, uh, on the uh, meetup page. Um, so yeah, um, and of course you don't have to be a domain expert to show something. I mean, uh, now we are, again have a lot of vendors here. Um, last time we had also somebody just showing off, hey, this is what we do. These are our experiences, good and bad. That's already it, right? Uh, we're here to share. Um, this is not a, a competition, right? So if you want to share what you're doing with Cloud Native Computing, that would be super interesting. Um, I'm not saying it would be more interesting than the vendors, but I appreciate the vendors, of course, as well. But it would be um, super interesting, of course, for all of us. Cool. And with that, uh, let me hand over to Daniel from Ergon to um, introduce himself and the company we're visiting today. Thank you very much. Oh no, that's working great. So welcome also from, from Ergon side. Um, for the ones in the public that don't, don't know Ergon, Ergon is a Swiss software company here based in Zurich. Uh, by the way, um, we're the, we were voted the number one best employer last year um, in our company size. And uh, we're happy to, to host this event tonight. Um, I am working in, the, uh, in a department within Ergon th that's called Airlock, and it's about all about application security. And um, we're also working a lot on, on dev, bringing the SEC into DevOps at the moment. And actually, together with Vision, we have produced this, um, this poster about DevSecOps. Can you all read this? <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm not expecting you to read this. We have copies for everyone interested here. And for the ones online, um, we'll make sure you, you get, you get a, a PDF copy as well. I want to briefly talk about how uh, the background of this poster, if you allow me, it takes about 10 minutes. Maybe you have been in the position before that one of your software projects was blocked by the security team or the release was delayed shortly before it went live. If that happened to you, then I have a few, few things for you that might be interesting. So, this is slideless, what they call slideless. How do we put the, the SEC in DevSecOps? Well, basically, the, the problem is that the cost of fixing a security issue rises with time. So the, ti the time to fix and the cost to fix a security issue rises exponentially. But the problem is now we're, we're investing most of our efforts very late in the process, very late, shortly before um, software goes live or, or the project is, is um, finished. And of course, this, this has a lot of issues. And what we want to achieve, finally, is 
invest more time at the beginning, address security issues during development already. So we want to move or shift this left. I'm sure you have heard this before. Shift left. So we want to address as many issues as possible during development stages. During coding, you probably know there's a category of tools um, that's called um, static application security um, testing. And these tools, they scan your source code and they find the bad smells, like this could be an injection maybe, or this could be some um, cross-site scripting vulnerability. Gives you a very early alarm already during developing or maybe before commit. We have something similar that's possible to, to give you early warnings um, during testing, and that's called dynamic application security testing. It's like a black box test, black box test, like a, an automated penetration test. And also during build time, there's these SCA tools uh, for um, software composition analysis. Here, which all the, the components of, of, your, um, by, uh, of, your, of your project are, are scanned for any vulnerabilities. So if there's a known vulnerability in any of your open source projects you're using, in any of your libraries you're using, this is going to give you um, an alarm. So the question is, does it work in, in reality? Anybody, anybody using these tools? Who's doing software composition analysis to scan, the, to scan the libraries? A few. Great, great. Let's do the reality check. Let's go back five months. I think it was December 12th. Log4j vulnerability. Most of you probably remember. Um, let's, let's look at how a vulnerability like lock for, lock for shell um, behaves, be, behaves in reality. Of course, lock for shell existed before December 12, 2021, before this. But at, at some time it was known. Pretty fast there were some exploits. And also, very fast, the first fix was provided. Uh, if you remember, there was like two more fixes because they realized, ah, oh, we got this one and this one not patched already. But finally, they had some, they had some fixes for the Log4J, li uh, Log4j library. But that was only Log4J. Your application using Log4J probably depended on Log4J and many other, other libraries using Log4J. So there's a whole dependency graph here. Maybe this, this dependency one used just, just a few hours or a day to provide a fix, to provide a new version. Dependency two depended on this one and took a little bit longer because they had to rewrite the whole code to use the new, newest Log4j version. And dependency three had to wait for these to provide a fix. A new application needed all of these fixes to actually go live fully fixed at that time. So we have all these dependencies and that's just a, a, an example in, in reality it's probably a lot more complicated. So we have a, a vulnerability window between here and here. To be fair I'm not talking about the time before it, 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 it was uh, known but your application was already vulnerable. And the question is, how long does this normally take to fix a vulnerability, a critical vulnerability? And I will do a, a quick quoting here. Let's say you have three, three numbers. 30 days, 90 days, 200. Time to fully fix your application. What do you think is the average? There's a company tracking these numbers regularly. Who's for 200? Who's for 90? Who's for 30? Almost nobody for 30. So the, it's, pretty, it's pretty bad. 
that's, that's the average, 200 days. And the question is, can we afford for our application to be vulnerable during that time? Even though we have all these in place, we know we're vulnerable, but we have to wait 200 days on average until we're no longer vulnerable. And the, the answer is shift left is one important part, but that it's not enough. We also need something on the right side. And there's a term, shield right, that pretty much sums up what um, we also need here. And we want, you want to protect your application at runtime because maybe it's already live at the time th that the vulnerability appears. Um, and then your uh, SCA tells you, hey, you have a, a vulnerability. What do you do? You need some uh, application self-protection, some web application firewall, some API security gateway, something like that. And these tools are great and they can help you protect from this vulnerability. Maybe they protect you even before the vulnerability appears. And that can also help you gain time because um, you can virtually patch the vulnerability so you're no longer vulnerable even you ha if you haven't patched your application. There's only a small issue with these tools. They're centralized, they're heavy. The developer probably does not, does not even know that there's something running here at, at, um, at the operation time. So we're back into the old game. We find issues with the integration between these components and your application very late in the process. How do we fix this? Well, the good thing is, I need a new pen. The solution has a name and it's called micro gateway and a micro gateway is basically a cloud native very lightweight uh, mini web application firewall mini API gateway and it can integrate it already at testing or even at development time because it's so it's so lightweight and it helps you integrate this runtime protection already in the dev cycle that's that's the cool thing if you think this is interesting, if you're interested in this, talk to Stefan, he's in the back with the, with the blue airgun shirt. Um, go to our website. Or if you're interested in this um, poster, we have one for everyone available there. And the ones online, um, get the link by, uh, for the PDF. That's it from my side. Have fun with the talks. Thank you. So we're going to switch now to Christian Feninger and our first. Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Perfect, thank you very much. So, hi everybody. Thank you all for joining. I would love to be there also, but unfortunately I couldn't make it. But uh, yeah, enjoy the evening, enjoy the beers and the pizza afterwards. So let me share the screen to start. Can you see the, the slides now? Okay, good, perfect, thanks. So, yeah, my name is Christian Penninger. I'm a senior process engineer uh, working at SUSE. I'm responsible for the Alps region. 
And then I would like to give you a, an overview and an introduction to Harvester, which is our uh, new hyper-converged infrastructure solution. So the agenda uh, looks like follow, as follows. There is a, a short introduction about SUSE, then a quick overview about uh, Harvester itself, and then the main part will be a live demo. Hopefully it will work all. That's always uh, sometimes not always good with uh, live demos. And at the end, we should have time for a Q&A session. But I think anytime you have a question, you just can ask them also. Okay. Some quick facts about SUSE. SUSE was founded in 1992 in Nuremberg, in Germany, and is uh, still uh, our current headquarter location. And maybe interesting, the name SUSE is an acronym of uh, Software and System Entwicklung. Uh, we also brought the first commercial uh, enterprise Linux version to the market. And since 2001, we have a very strong partnership with SAP. Uh, and best example for this partnership uh, is, I think, SAP develops their HANA solution solely on SUSE uh, Enterprise Linux. In 2019, uh, we became an independent company. So the, there was an investor called AQT. He is the, an, an exclusive investor. Then in 2020, we acquired the Ranger Labs. And in, since uh, April, more or less, uh, 2021, SUSE is the, went going public and is listed on the Börse in Frankfurt. And also in 21, we acquired uh, another company called Neuvector, which is specialized in container security. Okay, so what is the current status uh, in the infrastructure space? So containers and cloud native technologies are really growing very fast and therefore also demanding more compute resources at a much higher pace. Uh, and just because running containers uh, is a very easy and quick proce uh, process nowadays, we still need to care about the underlying infrastructure. We still must manage storage and networking and compute resources. And also besides the high growing rate of uh, container workload, virtualization is still growing and VM workloads are still a priority uh, for IT operators, which also creates demands for additional compute resources. And all due to these uh, reasons, we really need to be able to quickly respond to the demand for compute resources. And this can best addressed by a, a hyper-converged infrastructure solution, and in particular by Harvester, which can help you to fulfill this demand in an easy and cost-effective way. Why this is, we will see during the session. So what is Harvester? So Harvester is a modern hyper-converged infrastructure solution built and uh, designed for the cloud native environment. It is built on a foundation of cloud native solutions, including Kubernetes, Longhorn, which is the, our storage solution, and Kubert for the virtualization part. This making it a lightweight software-driven solution. It is a turnkey enterprise-ready solution designed to work anywhere from the on-premise until to the edge. It provides also IT operators with uh, familiar features as other hyper-converged infrastructure solutions with the additional benefits uh, of uh, unifying VM workloads and container through its integration with Ranger. And also, Harvester is 100% open source and it's free to use from this perspective. 
so you don't have any licensing or hardware fees if you use the open source version. Of course, there is also a, a supported version which you can buy a subscription from, but basically it's an open source version. So the Harvester architecture consists uh, of a cluster with at least three nodes. I know on this picture we can only see two, but uh, it really needs at least three. And each of these uh, nodes is, is running at the bottom uh, SUSE Linux or SUSE Enterprise Linux. And top of it, there is a Kubernetes, which is our RKE, it, which is called our Ranger Kubernetes engine, which creates a secure and stable base. Then in Kubernetes, it's installed at Longhorn, our storage solution, as already mentioned and also the, the QBird for the virtualization part. So all VMs which are, which are your workloads are running on top of Harvester. Regarding networking, each VM connects into the management network. Uh, so yeah, of course, every uh, VM needs to be managed from, from the managed point of view and you can create multiple VLANs, as much as you need. And you can connect also uh, multiple networks to one VM at the same time. So traffic is isolated uh, across the, the VM. And this is provided uh, due to the Motus and the Harvesters uh, network CNI plugin. And obviously when you add more nodes to the Harvester cluster, then it reconfigures itself because it's just a Kubernetes cluster. And the, all these VMs, you have so so-called uh, then uh, you know, a shared compute platform. So one resource pool, which you can then add to your VM workloads or to your Kubernetes cluster, which are running on top of this. So this slide is just to illustrate that you can really run uh, Linux or Windows VMs as well as Kubernetes clusters, which are running on top of, uh, of VMs side by side on top of Harvester. And also due to the tight integration with Ranger, you can manage all workloads from a, a single user interface. So also no matter uh, if they run uh, in an on-prem or in a NetSuite location or even in the cloud, maybe you use some uh, hosted Kubernetes which runs on, uh, on Amazon, on Google, whatever you want, you still have only one user interface. So how do we deploy uh, Harvester? So the deployment is, uh, of Harvest is very simple, easy, and a really straightforward process. So you can uh, install it either by uh, booting up uh, an ISO image or booting it from, from a Pixie boot installation. When the installer comes up, it offers you basically two options to create a, a new cluster, or you can add a node to an existing cluster. And due to this installation process, we need to provide some, uh, yeah, some information like uh, you need to define a host name, you need to select a disk to install, you need to select uh, uh, the network interfaces, some credentials and so forth. Not so much, it's about 10 to 15 uh, values that you have to bring in. Some of them are optionals, and when you all have this, you just hit enter, and it installs all the things for you and reboots then afterwards as a Harvester node. The node also joins automatically the, the Harvester management system, which can be uh, the node then administered through this uh, Harvester management console, which you can uh, reach uh, uh, as, as a web service. Regarding upgrade, it's uh, also really a straight uh, forward process. Uh, you have two options. So if the, the cluster has direct uh, access to the internet, uh, then 
it's really easy. Otherwise, you need to, to download the, the ISO file from the from GitHub and uh, then just yeah, change the, the URL information in the YAML file and then you go really straightforward. So this already concludes the, the, the first uh, part. If there are no questions, then I will jump into the demonstration. Give me a second to move. Okay, so we're, I rate this as a no. Uh, you still can see my uh, now the browser. Okay, thank you. So what you can see here is 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 the Ranger user interface. So as I mentioned, we have a very tight integration from Harvester into Ranger, and uh, maybe some of you already know Ranger. And uh, here we have a, a, a Kubernetes cluster, which is a, a demo. This is our demo uh, lab in Nuremberg. And uh, when I click here on the actual version, we have a new menu point called virtualization management. And uh, when I click here, let me go to this. Yeah, then we can see here we have always the clusters. We have one cluster, which is the one in Nuremberg. So now I'm on the on the Harvest cluster on, on the user interface, which is also integrated to Ranger. And the first uh, screen is the dashboard, which uh, you can see some basic information about your, your cluster. So it uh, shows you how many hosts are in the cluster, how many virtual machines are already deployed, how many networks are defined. There are a few images, uh, the images uh, store, which you can then uh, provision VM workloads of it, and also how many volumes that are already in use. Then we have uh, some uh, information about capacity, CPU memory storage, basic information, and then we scroll down, we have uh, some basic matrix also about the cluster. Also, we can uh, move here to the virtual machine. This is a little bit more difficult because there are lots, if there are hundreds of virtual machines, it will be difficult to show here, but you can then also select the virtual machine uh, one by one. Then the next point is uh, the, the host. Then we can see here again the host as an overview. So we can see that we have three hosts here, uh, host name, IP addresses, and also an overview of our CPU memory and storage. And when we go to the right side and right click, we have here some, uh, some options which you can choose for each node. So we can, uh, for example, cordon a node, which means that you no, no longer, uh, or, the, or the node will no longer accept any uh, new virtual machines or any new workloads to run on it. Uh, or you can even enable the management and uh, maintenance mode, excuse me. And then maintenance mode will uh, evacuate all the running VMs also we create a live migration of the VMs to the other nodes, that the node really will be without any workloads that you then can do some maintenance on it. You also can then here edit the configuration and you also can go directly into the YAML file. Virtual machines, there are already a, a few virtual machines here which are running. We have also created one, but we will come here to a later point in time. Then volumes, there are a lot of volumes. These are these, all these volumes, which are currently provisioned, which are used by the virtual machines. Then also images. Currently we only have two images, 
uh, we have spliced and also an Ubuntu image. We will see if we uh, can we create a virtual machine afterwards. Then we have the point project and namespaces. I think for, for everyone that uh, knows Kubernetes, namespace is, is a clear concept. Uh, project is uh, not from Kubernetes, project is from, from Ranger itself. So a project can basically, you can group namespaces together. So this has some advantages. Maybe if you have to, to create access uh, right or something else to, to several namespaces, if I have grouped them and everybody needs, uh, or every namespace needs the same changes, you can just do it on the, on the project level and then every namespace has these settings. Then we have the point for role-based access. Uh, as you can see, we have here uh, only a few cluster members. So we have uh, uh, local users and also from the, from the LDAP group. And they are currently all in the role of uh, cluster owner. We also have uh, uh, different roles which you can assign to the, to the users. Then here in the advanced part, we have a uh, possibility to create templates, which makes it much easier to, to create virtual, uh, virtual machines based on templates. We have here backups. I will show you that also uh, to create a backup and also to restore a virtual machine. Then we have here some uh, networks. These are the networks which, which are currently configured on the host. Then also SSH keys, which you can use then to, to access the virtual machines when you create them. And also cloud config templates, uh, which I also created one, which I will use then for creating a virtual machine. Uh, this just creates a user with my, for me, uh, the user cPanning with a defined password. So I can open it, this has the YAML file also here with the English password, it's a hashed password, of course. Okay, so let's create uh, quickly a new virtual machine. I hit here the create button. Then I have to give a, a name to the virtual machine. So CTF CNC demo, for example. Then I choose here the amount of CPUs. So it's just a small, I take I choose only one CPU. I give him about uh, two gigabytes of memory. I choose uh, an SSH key here. Then I go to the next point regarding the volumes. I take the, the default value here for disk zero. I could here uh, choose what it is. Is the disk or the serial? Of course, it's the disk we need. Here I can choose the image. So yeah, let's choose the first one. I can use a slash 15 here. The size 10 gig is okay. The bus type is also okay. Leave it as default. Regarding network, I will not use the management network. That's not good. Let's take the, the VLAN 65, for example. And I, I leave it to the default values here. Here we have uh, a node scheduling, which I will not use. I will just use the default. So the default is run uh, the VM on any available node. You can also uh, specify a specific node, which then will, of course, live migration will not work because it's bound to that host. Or you can also run VM on, uh, on matching some scheduling rules. But I will allow her to, to run on, on any of these nodes. So always we will take care about uh, the load balance and so on. Here we have the advanced option, which I will use now for the cloud config. So I will just choose my yeah, cloud config for creating my user that I can log in then. And that's basically all. I will just hit here create. And then it will create. It, it 
just a small VM, but uh, let's wait a little bit. In the meantime, uh, maybe I can show you here uh, another VM. So I will just open a, a console. Hopefully my username works here. Yeah. Quickly ping something that is uh, known here that it works. Yeah. So the aim of this, I would like to show you a, a live migration. So I do a live migration of this virtual machine to another node. And uh, when it all works nicely, then uh, we will not lose anything. So uh, I have to go now here to the, to the VM. Yeah. Click here on the right side and click on migrate. Now I can choose the target node. Uh, take the first one and then just hit apply. Now I have to look for the, yeah, that we can see again. Maybe the, as you can see, the, the response time will go up. Of course, there is a, a little bit delay then but it will not lose any things so far. So let's see if it's already done here. Or... Yeah, it's already migrated to the other host. So it's, it's really small, so it goes really quickly. You have to look. Okay. That's fine. Let's go up to the other. Yeah, so here this uh, virtual machine is already running. Now, one other thing I uh, would like to show you here is, uh, for example, to take the backup. Very easy. So let's create a simple, simple backup. So click here. Yes, I hope all this name was not already used. No. I'm blocking, so it's now initiated. So it's not a big, so uh, VM, so I will quickly go to the backups. Yeah, we can see that it, it's now progressing. It's doing a backup in the background. These backups, uh, you can, uh, where you want to store this backup, you can configure. So it can be, uh, for example, an NFS store. And this is also the case here. So it's already done here, the backup. Uh, what I can show you now also, for example, a restore, I have two options. So I, I can either replace the existing virtual machine or restoring it to a new one, which I will do now. Obviously I have to provide then uh, also a, a new name. This one. Now, now it's it's uh, already restoring the virtual machine, and this only take uh, uh, a few moments as it's really a, a small virtual machine. So, in the meantime, not to lose too much time, let me quick go back. To the home page of Ranger. As we see, we only have this one demo cluster, this Kubernetes cluster. What I want to show you now is to how can I easily create a, an additional Kubernetes cluster which is backed on, on the Harvester infrastructure. So I just click the create. Then I have here a, a lot of options where I can uh, yeah, create a new cluster. So I will uh, use this one here, the, the infrastructure providers here is also Amazon EC2 or something like this, or you can put it on a VM or a vSphere environment. I will choose now Harvester, of course. And this is now the, the same Harvester cluster as we only have this one uh, configured in this uh, environment. I just, give them uh, also a name, a unique name. 
Let's see. Uh, yeah, demo. Oh, it's, it's not really me. Okay, uh, then I feel the, the machine tools, so I will just create a single node cluster, so otherwise it will take too much time. So here I can choose uh, how many machines. Of course, if you have only a single node cluster, then you will have all the roles, the etcd control plane, also the worker role. I will leave here the, the CPU and all as the default value. Choose here the, the namespace, will also the default. And here I have to choose also an image for the underlying virtual machine. And just to show you that we are really open, open source, I will uh, use not a slice, I will use an Ubuntu. Then uh, also a network, uh, I think it's the 66 for these clusters. Then here, yeah, let's. Uh, an SSH user, a little bit scrolling down here. Here I can choose the Kubernetes version. So I will not use the, uh, the experimental, but let's say the, the, the newest, which is stable. Uh, by the way, if, if I would have, uh, let's say, chosen this one, and want to upgrade a Kubernetes cluster to a newer version, I just go here in or click the config of the Kubernetes cluster, choose here the, the newer one, click uh, on, uh, on create or enter, and then you will automatically uh, upgrade the Kubernetes version for you. Really, really simple. Uh, I have, I can here change the container network so default is this calico i have some other options a kernel Celium, and also we have uh, several motos if you have multiple uh, network interface i leave it as a default uh, also securities and as you can see we have uh, yeah a lot of other kubernetes specific options that i will not go in more in detail as it would a little bit too much for this because we are in the harvest and not in the, in the ranger space now. So I will just create it. That's, I think, enough. And then I can go back. Let's uh, just refresh the screen, then you can see. Yeah, now it's uh, it's creating the virtual machine for the for the Kubernetes cluster, it's starting up, and then it will uh, you can see it also on the on the range part. So in the meantime, also this was uh, already done. The, the restore of this uh, is already done. So this will take some time. Uh, let's go on this, and maybe we can already see. Yeah, it's. It's here, but it's it's still not. So it's provisioning. It will take some time until all the Kubernetes stuff is, is up and running and it's configured. But then it, it will show as active at the end. So from this point of view, if, if this uh, cluster will be active or so, this yeah concludes more or less the the overview demo for the harvester part and uh, yeah so we will have some yeah we have a good time so 15 minutes still if you have questions or want to see something else which i can do in the demo environment i cannot all do everything here because it's a, it's a remote environment i don't have the, the, all the, the admin access to it but yeah is there any questions so far please let me know Good question, yeah. <laughs>
So I think a main, uh, a main, uh, yeah, maybe it could be also a, a price, a, a pr simple price uh, question. I mean, it's it's open source, so VMware is not open source. Of course, OpenStack is also open source, but I think it's with OpenStack you have. Uh, yeah, it's not so uh, quick and easy installed like Harvester. So OpenStack, I would say you'll have uh, a few hours more to, to get it up and running. It's really easy and it's all modern. And I think especially the use case, let's say that the positioning of, of Harvester is, is clearly not to, to go in and out to customers and say, hey, we are customer, you have uh, VMware or you have Nutanix or whatever that these these are the all the since many years they are in this space we will just uh, replace them all that's that's not I mean we are happy if the customer wants to do that but it's not the intent to do that it's, it's really not the intent the intent is more to uh, new use case and it's really focused on uh, on container workloads and I mean. Container workloads is yeah is, 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 will be the most workloads, but in an ideal world we want to have only container workloads. But we are not living in an ideal world, so we still have applications that they don't run on in containers, or doesn't make sense, or you can't, whatever. So virtual machine workloads will still be there for I think a long time. So the idea is behind that you have the, the container and the, the VM workload on this on the same cluster, on the same management interface. So you always have the same look and feel. You don't need to change user interfaces and you have complete different uh, yeah, methods to, to, to create the same output at the end. For example, for, for access rights, uh, then you have to put it in this tool and you have to go to the other tool. The same applies also if you have uh, Kubernetes, let's say, on-prem, and you have also in, in Amazon or Azure, you always need to go to the, to the platform-specific user interface, and they are quite different. Does this more or less uh, answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay, regarding two-factor authentication, so this is, can be done as uh, from the ranger part of you. So you have from from ranger part, you can we, we support then uh, se several authentication methods, and uh, you can also integrate there. Uh, it's it's not driven by us, but it's uh, you can integrate these into the range part. So that's absolutely not an issue there. And the other one, uh, Ingress, this will be, uh, yeah, from my perspective, this will be handled then in, in the Kubernetes part, not in the Harvester part. You have this, this Ingress. So because Harvester is just a yeah, hyper-converged infrastructure solution, and uh, the, the Ingress part and, and the Ingress part will, will be part of, of the Kubernetes. So then it's related to uh, to Ranger, and then yes, you can manage it. You're welcome. So yeah, now as you can see here, it's uh, it's active. So now this is now. Uh, Kubernetes uh, cluster dashboard. It's not the Harvester dashboard. It looks very similar. You also have node deployments, uh, how many resources, also some capacity. 
So as we have really yeah, low resources, not much resources, already uh, over 50% used. You can see here all the events and all that stuff. And then go back to the Harvester part here. This is the, the virtual machine, which is the, on top of it, uh, is running virtu uh, Kubernetes. Yeah. Are there any questions or should I? Sh yeah. Good question. <laughs> uh, so, so the the whole stuff will be uh, if, if you so you want to ask if I understand correctly if Harvester provides some additional features more on top of what Ranger provides. Is that correct? Yeah. So. I would say no. So it's it's that it's driven by 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 the Ranger integration, and the the meaning. In, I think if uh, when you use the, the open source version, then of course it's uh, it's for free. But uh, if you want to have a supported version, you can't uh, use Harvest on its own. So you always need to have both Harvest and Ranger. So that, that's the reason, and, and also that's the reason why it's all done by Ranger, this part. And uh, Harvester provides the infrastructure and Ranger makes the other part. But of course, you could, you could try to use it, but these features are then provided by Ranger. I I recognize his voice. <laughs> Good. All questions uh, directly to him now, please. <laughs> no, no. So I I didn't uh, understand uh, all from from a voice perspective, but. Uh, Good. Thank you, Claudio. Any more questions? So I will not uh, steal the time. So yeah, please. A load balancer solution for the VM. So I mean, if you yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's clear. I mean, you always need need the. Uh, you should have a load balancer in, in front, but it's not a, it's not a, a SUSE and it's in general you use this, uh, this standard like a, an Nginx or something like that. And you do this also on the, on the, for the Kubernetes part on the Ranger part and you can just uh, uh, create one or you have uh, a, a known load balancer, which is uh, even a hardware load balancer or something because you yeah you need you need to have something but we don't uh, in in harvester i believe we don't i mean it's 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 doing the the workload it's it's, it's just uh, 
balancing, but it's it's not that load balancing because you have only the the, the single uh, entry point. So this is done by even uh, an external load balancer, or you can uh, provide it also on the ranger. So install it on the ranger. Thanks for your time, guys, and uh, yeah, you will uh, soon. You will can enjoy the beers. Thank you all. Bye. Have a nice evening. Cheers.
Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Mateusz. I work for Red Hat here in Switzerland as a senior software engineer. The, the talk today I'm going to deliver is about infrastructure operator. The name may sound cryptic. Well, it's okay if it does because that's, that's why I'm making this presentation. In a more understandable way, I'm going to talk about how to easily and in a scalable way deploy OpenShift clusters on bare metal because this is how the project started in reality everywhere. So yeah, it's just, you know, the talk has to have a name and bare metal is hyped. So that's how we roll. Just a few safety disclaimers because, you know, big companies, corporations, contracts, legal and so on. During the presentation, I will be saying always OpenShift, but whether you put their OKD or Kubernetes and this kind of stuff, it's, you know, you do it. I will be saying bare metal for the same reason, but you can have a VM anywhere. It can be also your laptop, like doing my demos and so on. Again, up to you. So yeah, whenever I say it works too, it means for developers, for engineers, it works, but what is officially supported, it's always up to your contract. So yeah. I'm happy to talk about any combination you, you want because I'm from engineering, I'm, from, I'm not from legal, but if someone tries to quote me that this stuff works on, you know, whichever distribution, please don't quote. <laughs> okay, so let's get to the meat of the, of the stuff. So the very first question, containers on bare metal, it sounds like we are skipping one layer of abstraction because we are used to doing like hundreds years ago bare metal, then we are used to doing, let's say 50s, 60s VMs on bare metal, and then we run the workload. And then some years ago, the hype for containers came, but the very standard model of deploying containers was bare metal, VM, container. But then people started to ask the question, why do I need this VM layer? Can I do containers directly on, on bare metal? And the use cases are, are very different. So of course, starting from what is hyped right now. So all the artificial intelligence, machine learning, high performance computing, for these workloads, it's something that we can easily understand. Because if someone tells us that they are fighting for every percent of performance, for every single CPU cycle, we can believe them if they are telling us that you know they are doing high performance computing and this kind of stuff. But there are some more unique use cases that are not so obvious, but in reality, they are also requiring the same, the same stuff. And this is telco customers in the edge. So what does it mean? For already a few years, we have 5G and all this hype, or no 5G, depends from which canton you are coming. But in principle, what happens? You get this huge, you know, tower, cell tower, you install antennas, but you also install some compute units there. And what happens? In 5G, everything what can be moved to the edge, so to this particular cell, is moved. In reality, it means that all those 5G cells, they are having x86 server attached, and most of the workload is running there. So as much of the network infrastructure, operators trying to move there. And of course, this is some workload. Let's, if, it is, if it's a workload, we can run it as a container. Apart from this, critical network equipment, and here I mean either stuff that we just cannot run VMs because, this, because the hardware stack is so specific that there is no hypervisor running there, or because of the criticality, we want to reduce every single component that can fail. So the smaller number of components in our stack, the better. Specialized hardware, this is something that doesn't need a lot of explanation, I think. GPUs, but also network interfaces, smart network interfaces. This is also something that is becoming hyped recently. And once again, network interface, as we know it, you plug the cable, it takes electricity, it gives you bits and bytes, right? But right now, smart NICs, they also have effectively x86 compute units in there. So we want to use all this stuff. And, and again, every layer, in this stack is making this more difficult. Of course, we can do something as simple as, you know, GPU pass through, PCI pass through, but that's not the point. It's hacking our way around. And also one more use case that no one ever talks because this is not use case that you can easily sell, but people who are doing this, they really need that. This is benchmarking because, okay, you can be, you know, big company producing servers, producing hardware, but at some point, people want to see numbers. And how do you deliver those numbers to them 
if the testing stack requires to deploy so many components that you know the whole purpose of benchmarking is lost so so once again if you can deploy container directly on bare metal then you can claim that your result results are really benchmarking the bare metal and not the hypervisor you are using without telling names here but that you know i i fear the numbers that you know best out of the best claim the the vm is taking only one percent but there are also cases in you know very specific wor workload that you can lose 50% because if your workload requires some specialized NUMA and then your hypervisor has no idea what NUMA is, then goodbye, you just lost and you know, every CPU cycle is going to be, to be wasted there. So yeah, this is the motivation for containers on bare metal, but till now, you know, anyone can do it. There is nothing special about OpenShift and why, why do I even, you know, give this talk? So we created this product which started as infrastructure operator but at the same time it got this name assisted installer because people started using it as something that you know helps them with the with the installation because the very first the very first problem and this is something that is coming from very early days of kubernetes very early days of openshift of you know every container orchestration platform someone if someone tells you that they didn't have this problem like never ever they are just lying because for every platform there was always this problem how to install it at the very beginning because you know everyone is is you know telling you ah it's so easy to scale my kubernetes cluster it's so easy to deploy more workload there it's so easy to do all these day two operations upgrade cluster and so on and so on but then you ask them yes but how do you install this cluster in the first place it's so nice that you have those you know 600 nodes and they form a cluster but how did you install those 600 nodes so so yeah so back back in the days it was you know either you just sit and do this stuff manually for openshift the command was openshift install for kubernetes there was also equivalent command and you know then then you were spending hours typing and then you know step by step some some kind of guide and then came stuff like ansible playbooks this is what openshift was doing for a long time it was some kind of a middle ground but it was still a lot of code that was you know just just wrapping around some cli that exists somewhere and and yeah then era of tectonic and you know what not people started using even terraform and then this kind of stuff i think now for for everything you have some plugin that can install kubernetes or or openshift but again it's easy if you want to install one OpenShift cluster, one Kubernetes cluster using those playbooks. If you want to install two of them, maybe okay. If you install 10 of them, probably you want to ask yourself, why do I even work for those guys? And then you go into, you know, N plus N, infinite number of OpenShift clusters, and it just, you know, mind blown. So how do you install arbitrary number of clusters? Not one, not five, not 10, but you know, 600. You are deploying a network in a country of a size of, you know, Germany. It's not like there are 10, 10 stations. You need to deploy really tons of, of clusters. And, you know, the very basic question I should have asked at the beginning is, do we treat clusters as pets or cattle? And for a very, for a very big fraction of companies out there, it's still the first, which makes me sad. We are trying to shift it towards the cattle, so you shouldn't think about a cluster, each particular cluster, the cluster, just a flock of clusters. If I ask you how many clusters do you have, I don't exact answer, you know, 451. Just tell me order of magnitude, like, you know, hundreds of thousands, and this is all I need, because when I ask you how much memory do you have in your, you know, in your laptop, how much free memory, you will tell me, yeah, I use around half of what it delivers. You will not tell me till the very kilobit how much your Chrome is using, even though it's using everything it can. So, yeah. Okay, so what is this stuff? Because it's quite complicated at the very beginning the next slide will be even worse so brace yourselves but i will be doing two demos so i will try to make it kind of you know seamless and nice and you know shiny you know how it is with live demos so in principle the problems we are trying to solve here if you are familiar anyhow with installation of openshift for a long time you needed to have this bootstrap server which effectively was a machine that was triggering the installation but it wasn't triggering installation on itself it was triggering installation somewhere else so again if you install one cluster manually probably you can afford this one server but if you install 600 clusters now and each of these installation requires one more server like come on this is it's, it's just insane it doesn't scale 
So with this approach, we are removing this need. So if you are installing cluster of three nodes, you only need three nodes and you know your laptop because you can also work from phone, but it doesn't make sense. But you don't need this additional server just for the installation process. Then we have this concept of discovery image for inspecting the hardware. Long story short, we are trying to also protect people from doing stuff they shouldn't be doing, which is, you know, I can take my fridge, connect it to the internet and try installing Kubernetes there. Probably it will fail because I have no idea. Maybe someone from this industry is there. How much RAM do you have on this smart fridge? Whatever the number is, it's not enough to host a cluster. So this kind of stuff we, we need to check, but also a bit more complicated stuff like, you know, a cluster sounds easy, but then we already had this question, you know, ingress, egress, and so on and so on. So at some point you need to start having some DNS somewhere. And most of the people, okay, if you read documentation, you know all of this, but as an engineer, I don't read documentation. I take a product, I try to use it, and I see what works, what, what not. So, so we give you something that will stop, from, stop you from doing this. If you just take it and try, we will tell you before you even start, sorry, sorry, this is not going to work. So this is a yeah, discovery image, and then something more from the backend. So we give you REST API, we give you Kubernetes API, so CRDs, and we give you UI. Because whatever your role is, you may prefer to click, 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 you may want to do some curl, you may want to use Kubernetes CRD like proper, you know, like, like you should do properly. So, so yeah, this is, this is one mode. And something else, SaaS and self-hosted, this is mostly to answer a question because I will be doing demo here and there. You know, when we do everything in cloud, it's super nice if stuff is connected. But then you want to install a cluster that will be running on a warship. And this warship doesn't have internet connection all the time. It's offline environment, it's disconnected. You connect it to internet once, or maybe not even once. You do what you are supposed to do, and this is it. This server will never ever be connected anywhere you will not even plug USB stick there. So we also want to address that because again, life is very easy if you always have internet connection. My laptop has today very weak internet connection, so we will see and yeah, it, it will be fun. And the last point, zero touch provisioning, boot it yourself. Those are some, let's say, buzzwords because on one hand, we have something, zero touch provisioning, which means as soon as you give me credentials to BMC of your server, I will do everything that's needed to give you a working cluster. Give me IP address, username, and password to the BMC of the server, and this is it. Go, grab yourself a coffee, long coffee because it's usually half an hour up to an, up to an hour, and come back and I give you cube config. This is it, nothing more. Or boot it yourself, which is more step by step. It's, it's more that you define what you would define, but instead of giving me password because you don't trust me, I give you ISO and I tell you it's up to you how you boot server from this ISO, but as soon as you boot it, I will do everything for you. So again, trade-off, because not all the machines have BNC. I will be doing some stuff on my laptop, it doesn't have BNC, but still I want to install OpenSheet on my, on my laptop. So, so yeah, this, this kind of stuff. We want to address everything that, that you can address. So yeah, the flow does just very quickly because it's already getting boring. I'm just talking, talking, talking without showing anything. So yeah, we create an ISO and then in the zero touch provisioning, there is something called bare metal operator that I will not go into details that will boot the server from this ISO. This is the discovery image that I mentioned quickly before. And this agent will report back to the service with the inventory of the server so that we can check. Is the RAM okay? Network interfaces, are they okay? Maybe you are dropping, dropping packets on your network interfaces. If you are dropping too much, sorry, this is not going to work. Maybe your disk is too slow. In principle, no one ever cares about this. But if you have too slow disk, your cluster is going to die because ETCD is going to die. ETCD is super fragile to slow disks and latency. So again, this is something no one ever checks. People come with clusters that are utterly broken only for us to discover that it's, 
it does that drive because they use some network storage attached somewhere on some other continent and they are complaining that you know with ping 300 they cannot have etcd running on a cluster like seriously come on so this is kind of stuff that we that we do and then we start installation and we give you ocp this is for standalone and sas and yeah the, the simple workflow just to mention, but I will not go into details. There is a product called Advanced Cluster Management or Open Cluster Management. And in principle, this is something if you have hundreds or if you have a big flock of clusters, it's advised that you have some central entity that will monitor all of them. So this is a product. And in, if you are running in this scenario, after we install this cluster of yours that you are doing right now, we will also report back this cluster to the central management so your flock can get updated and some security policies applied there and so on and so on. But this I will never mention again during this presentation, it just as a future reference. So yeah, this is the, this, you know, the worst slide on this presentation and yeah, I didn't spend much time on simplifying it. I just want to show you that internals of the service are relatively simple. So we have one database, we deliver as Kubernetes operator and we, and we give you a bunch of CRDs so that you can interact with us. Of course, all those connections, no, I'm not going to explain them. It just, what I want to mention here is that we have the concept of cluster deployment, which is a very generic interface saying, I'm going to install a cluster. Then you have instantiation of this interface, which is called agent cluster install. It's going to say, I'm going to install a cluster using this stuff that I showed you right now. Then you have infrastructure environment, infra env. This is a concept created it will be confusing, but there is a use case for this. Because in a lot of cases, you get hardware, you install it. But there are companies, there are policies that the person installing the hardware is not the person operating workload on top of this hardware. So we need to allow for different personas to define infrastructure and for different personas to say, let's install cluster there. So again, if you are from huge enterprise, probably you know that, that you cannot just go to the server plug and, you know, and play with that. If you are working in a small company, then it doesn't affect you because you do everything yourself. Then bare metal host, this is something very simple because this is the definition of the BMC. So if we are doing zero touch provisioning because this is the nicest, this is it. You will define URL, password, user, and this is it. Then what appears after we successfully inspect your machine is agent resource. I will just show you examples during the demo, so don't even you know, bother with remembering too much. And NM state config is, this I'm not going to show, but if you want to customize network configuration, you can define everything there. Because it's nice if you have DHCP, but in a lot of cases you don't have DHCP, you don't even run ethernet, you run some strange stuff. So you want to be able to plug any kind of network configuration into the cluster from the very beginning. Because it's easy to configure a network in a cluster that already works. But if I give you ISO and I need this ISO to call back home, how does it call if it's not even ethernet? So yeah, this, this, kind, of, this kind of use cases. So yeah, I have two demos prepared. Probably I will be running them somehow aside in parallel. Let's see how confusing this stuff gets. So one of them is on-prem zero touch provisioning using Kubernetes API. The other one will be SAS, boot it yourself. So I take ISO and I will boot it somewhere and we will be doing just click, click, click. So, so yeah. So if I go to the, to the interface of console.rehab.com, so you can already see that I'm starting from the UI. Yeah, now the resolution is not super good, so I'm not sure I'm going to see everything that I want to see. If there are some questions also, we can do it in the meantime because you know how demos are. So either you sit and, and watch me waiting or you know, or we do some interaction now. Yeah, so I'm not sure how to have, okay. Yeah, so I just went to the, to the Red Hat Cloud and I say create OpenShift cluster. So I, I can do of course cloud stuff and so on, but this is, you know, this is the easiest scenario and, and also this is not what it's about. The interesting part is data center. So I will be doing OpenShift on my own infrastructure, which is, yes, assisted installer. So I will create this cluster here 
and it asks me for some stuff. It doesn't ask a lot of questions, so yeah. So I'll just yeah, invent some name and, and just roll. I will pick OpenSheet version, so you can do whatever. We just expose some of them into cloud because this is what's tested and supported and all that. To make stuff even more fun, I will be installing single node OpenSheet because you are all used to, you know, to those big clusters that have HA and so on, but not everyone, not everyone wants that. Some people just want to have a cluster, Kubernetes, OpenSheet, whatever, on one node. They don't care about HA because the deployment doesn't, you know, doesn't rely on that. They want to have as small cluster as possible. I won't be doing ARM because this is not what I have. And yeah, effectively this is it. So I will click next and now backend is doing all the, all the magic. And yeah, we went to this step in host discovery. So it tells us waiting for host, which going back to this huge description I gave, service generated me an ISO that if I boot machine from, it will appear and will become my future cluster. So I will get this, this host here and now I will provide it SSH key, my public key, because you will have a lot of stuff running in this machine, but in principle, there will be some OS. For debugging purposes, sometimes you want to go into this machine, just SSH and see what happens, you know, not just blindly stare into the, into the UI, but go and play, you know, with stuff. So, so I can provide to the service my key, and I will get this embedded. So then during the installation, we can just see what, what happens inside. And yeah, I got this ISO and I got URL, I got a command how to, how to download it. So yeah, now the fun begins because I have no idea how fast the internet I have here is. So we will see how this stuff is going to roll. Okay, something happens there, yeah, one minute, it doesn't look very promising, but okay, let's, let's let it be like this. So in the meantime, let me jump to the second scenario of the demo. So we go now on-prem, forget about this. This runs in a background because I'm using internet of a provider I will not name, but they are not very fast. So let's, let's yeah, keep them in the background. So now more fun part, we won't be clicking in the UI and so on, I will just, show you that I have this cluster. Okay, that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> okay, here. So I have some OpenShift cluster. It's different, it's not a cloud now. It's a local OpenShift cluster that I installed. You can see from this strange domain that it just runs, it just runs locally. And there is this concept of yeah, operators in a cluster. You have operator hub, which is effectively a catalog with operators and this kind of yada yada. So I have operator installed here, which is infrastructure operator. And this is all from UI of this cluster you are ever going to see, nothing more. So more interesting stuff. This is now console of this cluster. So OC get cluster version. Yeah, typing live on a demo, that's always. Okay, so I have my cluster running on 4.10 nightly. And, you know, ju just to show you that this is some cluster and I have prepared the definitions of this stuff here. And now it's fun because the resolution here is not the biggest one. So let me, <laughs> okay, it's all visible. Nice, that's, that's easier. I thought it will not make it into one screen. So yeah, this is the definition of one of the CRs that we have, which is cluster deployment. And it's relatively simple because I just give it some name. So I will name the cluster meetup one. It lives in some namespace. So this kind of basic stuff, let's not even go there. But then the interesting part is the spec. So we define parameters of this cluster. So what you would usually do manually, I define here. So the cluster has, of course, a domain. The cluster has some name, the, the cluster has has some platform which forget for a moment because I don't want to confuse you even more. If you want to ask, let's go later into this. But in general, cluster always has a platform because it runs somewhere. Cluster has pool secret. And now we are going into the corporate fun because in order to install OpenShift, you need 
access to the images and the images are not just in Docker Hub and so on. So we need some Docker config and you know, this kind of stuff. You need to pass it also to the cluster because cluster will be pulling some, some images. And it has this strange thing, which is cluster install ref. Now going back to this word, no one likes interface. Cluster deployment is just a generic interface for installing cluster, but we need to define who's going to install this cluster. And this is exactly this. So we are saying that there will be agent cluster install object that will take care of installing this. And once again, I'm not going into details, but you may have your own interface, which you, which you will name, you know, Chocobomb cluster install. And the logic there will be totally different. It will be deploying stuff, you know, on your fridge because you can, you can deploy it maybe easier and so on. So if I go to the agent cluster install and now I'm making this stuff, is it visible or should I make it bigger and split into parts? That means yes or no? <laughs> okay, so yeah, so we are defining now this agent cluster install. And once again, we have some spec. So we are referring back to this cluster deployment. So yeah, boring stuff. You need to link somehow those objects. But then more interesting. So cluster needs to have a version, right? So I will define a version. And this is object image set ref. I will just show you, but this is not important in here because I defined what does it mean to install OpenShift v something something? It means that you will go to Quay and take this release of OpenShift and this is what's going to be installed. But of course, everything is nicer if you reference it by name, so this is it. I will be deploying cluster with one control plane agent. So again, I specify here what's going to how this cluster is going to look like, SSH key, and interesting stuff networking, because this is always the most interesting part, and this is also the most confusing usually. So I, I'm defining cluster network, machine network, and service network, and this is something that I assume that people who know Kubernetes will know, and if not, we can talk later about this. But for people that know this, you define everything here. One. Important thing here, I'm deploying dual stack clusters because I'm fan of IPv6. I think people should be using IPv6, so I'm deploying dual stack. And, and yes, this is the stuff. Infrastructure environment. This was this fake persona because it's not always me who does everything end to end. So, so this is a definition and it's very simple definition. You have only SSH key because you embed it into the ISO and, and this is it. So it exists, but it's not super interesting. The more interesting part is this one because I have definition of bare metal machine in there and you can see that this is now the whole meat of this zero touch provisioning because I'm defining that there is a machine that you can access BMC using this URL that has credentials in a secret that I defined just below and that this machine with specific book, boot mat boot MAC address. This is for us to ensure safety that if someone steals the ISO, they cannot just boot server with the same ISO in your data center and join the cluster. So the MAC address here is this kind of a link that we confirm that if you boot your ISO, you are really the machine that I expect because you could be men in the middle of my data center. And when I start booting 10 servers, you start booting your you know, fake server at the same time from the ISO you stole and you want your server to join the cluster. This will prevent that. And yeah, we, we are having this label here because again, it's easy if I install only one cluster because I have, you know, servers, one cluster, but if I install now 10 clusters at the same time, how do I know which machine is going to join which cluster? So I need a reference to the infra env, which is the stuff that I just deployed before. So let me deploy this stuff or let's switch contexts now and let's see if I have my ISO. I have my ISO. Okay, so now let's do fun part and I will try installing this on my laptop. I have no idea if we are ever going to see that because of the speed and all that. But you know, if we, if we don't try, we will never know. Uh, so I downloaded it to the TMP and I have this discovery here, uh, template, whatever. It doesn't really matter, it does Linux stuff. Uh, now this question, how much RAM do I have? Let's give it, okay, YOLO. <laughs> Disk, okay, let's, yeah. 
Okay, and the machine is booting. Let's just see if it, okay, it goes from this core OS. Now we won't see a lot of interesting stuff because we just downloaded a small ISO, but we need to download some more content from the internet. And this is what happens in a few seconds. Uh, ha, 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 ha. Yeah, this is always a boring stuff, this boot. Yeah, it got the network. Okay, whatever, I, I will show, oh, okay, this is it now. Yeah, so we booted from the ISO and now we are downloading from the, from the mirror OpenShift a full Arcos image, so we have full operating system because all the stuff I was waiting a few minutes for, it was only to boot the system. It wasn't the whole the whole operating system. So yeah, you know, at home it's nice because you have this, you know, 25 gig from init 7 and it works super fast. <laughs> no advertisement here, I don't use them at home, but they are the fastest around. But let's go back to this stuff here. And now let's apply all those resources because, you know, it's, it's nice to talk and all this kind of stuff, but at the end, you know, everyone wants demo to be, to be demo, so on C. So I'm applying cluster deployment. Then I will deploy. Yeah. <laughs> That's always nice, yes. The next one. If someone knows the syntax, how to apply it all in order, I would be very thankful to get to know this. <laughs> <laughs> in order, of course, yes. I'm, okay, technically speaking, we don't need in order, but if something breaks, I don't want to debug. Okay, I applied the infra and then this is the one responsible for generating ISO. So before I tell it to go to the server, I will check if the ISO really exists. So OC get infra env. Mm -hmm. Okay, we see the second one, meetup one, and we see that there is some ISO. If I show you this, yeah, there is some URL of this ISO. So, so yeah, this is what now is going to be taken by this stuff, which I called bare metal operator. This URL will be plugged into the, the server and it will start booting. So, so let's add it. So this is it, and now let's see what's happening with those servers. So OC get So you can see that the machine I added now is here. So yeah, it went through some status, which means that the that this setup here connected to the BMC of the server and started to boot it. So this is what what is happening there. And yeah, at this stage we have it as provisioned and nothing more is going to appear here. So now the next item that we are expecting, I told you, discovery ISO, it's going to report back to the service. And what's going to be reported back to the service is agent. So now we will do not bare metal host because bare metal host is just there, but we'll get agent and you see that there is still no agent that i created right now this one is something older i created just to show you the cluster that is already installed so yes as this stuff is running here let's give it a second in the meantime yeah you can see that this stuff is still downloading there but but this is all good this stuff on prem will be faster so I'm pretty sure that in the six minutes I still have, we will see it booted and starting the installation. But in the meantime, you can just jump into questions because I'm not going to click anything more. This is zero touch provisioning. So once it pops up, it's, it's just there. So my keyboard is not of a use anymore. So, so yeah, I will just go back here to the slides for a moment. Where do I have them? Oh, this is always a mess. <coughs> because I showed you some stuff, but of course, it would take much, much longer. There is some future work and future stuff to show you. So there is something called hypershift because you don't always need a full OpenShift cluster. Some, sometimes you don't care about control plane. So if we plug hypershift into all I've shown you, we wouldn't be installing OpenShift cluster on this server completely. We would be only installing a worker node 
to a hosted control plane. So we will have one cluster in which there will be a lot of control planes separated by namespace and our process of installing will be just installing worker node. This is again, usually you don't need 10 control planes if you have 10 clusters, but a lot of people, they separate OpenShift and Kubernetes clusters because they want to have this very strict separation. Because security, access, whatnot, you name it. You don't always need control plane as a, as a user. And something else that we are working on is cluster API. Because all those CRDs that, you sh that you've seen is something that we created. We invented them, but they are not upstream Kubernetes. What is upstream Kubernetes is called cluster API. So we are having now a provider that is at some development work that is using what is in upstream Kubernetes. So this is purely unification because we want, of course, at the end of the day to be as generic as possible. So, so this is stuff for the, for the future. Okay, yeah, so this is this VM that booted from this discovery ISO. And yeah, right now nothing really happens there. Yeah, because because it still downloads some stuff and and so on so so yeah whatever we can just we can s just see this here but yeah questions feel free and yeah Yay. ah perfect yeah so so the stuff appears and then you see that auto assigning the role and all this stuff because you always need to do it at some point the agent got approved because it was validating stuff it was comparing those mac addresses and so on and so on so so you know this is yeah And this is the object that installs the, the cluster. So yeah, because we already have agent approved there. So at some point the cluster will go into the state installing. So it still runs some validations and all this kind of stuff. So, so yeah, three minutes I have from my time, maybe five if we come differently. <laughs> really, nothing, no one does this stuff. <laughs> go on. Mm -hmm. also the case in we handle this. There is, so the concept is called bootstrap in place. So one of the nodes in the cluster is started as bootstrap. Once the cluster is formed, we pivot the node that was bootstrap and we make it a real, real cluster. So at no point in this process, you need this, uh, this additional bootstrap node. Okay. This, is, this is removed now. Yeah, and it went. So preparing for installation and then this kind of stuff, so yeah. So in like half an hour, yeah, if I had time, you would see. But, but again, nothing interactive happens here because it's zero touch. So yeah. So at some point you just get installed cluster and you have the, the cube, the cube CTL, which- one, one more question. How does it work for an AF environment? It, it does work. I will not describe a process here because yeah, because there is a, a lot of to explain, but it does work fully for, for air-gapped environment, also for the ones that never has, have access to the internet. So not only for those that you disconnect after installation, but also for those that are never in the internet. Does Alma follow the internet and do the cache there? Uh, pff, not half of the internet. I think you download four gigs of data. Yeah. This is more or less. Yeah, only the images effectively, yes. Okay, so thank you, just in time. <laughs>
zero, and you're live. Hey, it's my stage. OK, so hello. <laughs> We'd be honored to, to be in this building because Elgon does something similar to us. So it's, it's funny to see what, what others do. And now we are going to pitch you somewhat 100% open source software. So feel free to use it afterwards our, uh, without our help, hopefully. But in the end, it's kind of, yeah, let's figure it out. And I'm going to talk, and Fabian as well, about cloud native and identity and access management. So, who of you has ever thought he needs something like a better logging page? Nobody uses logging pages here, so that's great. Yeah, at least pen testers and our software engineers are uh, raising hands. <laughs> All of you guys have nothing needed to do something with a logging page. I'm astonished because at least your e-banking and your post and whatnot has a logging page. And most of them, I'm not really well hardened, but let's keep that for another session. So without further ado, it's me, you know, the, the, the guy who is doing architectural stuff and just talking too much, and Fabian, who hopefully brings down to a concise messaging what, what, what we're doing. And let's start. So it's kind of the story I want to tell you today is when you are building software today, at one point in time, you will handle something like authentication and authorization. Right? It's, it's highly secure that you will do that. I mean, otherwise you're running like a, an anonymous website, uh, like a blog or something like that, but that's fine. But at one point you might need to do uh, authentication. And that's what we think is, is kind of an important thing to talk about because if you are building XR software, uh, let's call it IS, PaaS, SaaS, whatever you like, you will end up using some product there. And I wanted to shine some light towards what capabilities are needed and what story is underlying that and who or what can help you bring that to a closure. Mm. So basic capabilities. If you ever need something like a login, that's kind of roughly what you need. And if you have questions here, go ahead and talk and, and, and ask me directly because it, it's easier to answer them as we go. And basic capabilities is a simple authentication. I mean, before some of you guys ask whether there is 2FA included or not, if we talk simple authentication, it's not 2FA, and that's username and password, deal done. And even that can be made wrong. Like, we can talk at least 50 minutes about password hashing. I mean, that for itself is kind of a big deal. But still, basic capabilities, yeah, user self-service, user should be able to reset its password after its own. And if you are building a software and you need to take care of all those building blocks aside the business logic you're currently building, yeah, you, you're in a bad mood because if you're running a startup and have two to three developers, you don't want to build that stuff. So you e will either end up using a framework or a turnkey solution uh, we will talk about them a little bit later, but still you will end up doing something like that mm? or using something like that. Mark my words. If you don't do it, uh, a login is not just two input fields and a button. If you want to talk <laughs> about that with me, I'm totally fine afterwards with a lot of beer, we can deal stuff. I mean, yeah, XSRF, yeah, there is a lot of stuff going there. So uh, if you want to improve the life for your customers at one point, Maybe you want to have single sign-on, well, maybe, maybe, maybe. Multi-factor authentication, yeah, that's a big bubble like passwordless and 2FA and whatnot. Yeah, you can throw a lot of things into multi-factor, but it's a really vital part of the story nowadays. And identity brokering, which, uh, yeah, you could use other words for that, like, oh, I want to use my uh, Google login and my Facebook login and my Twitter login and whatnot. But still, the system will abstract away all the pain you have to, to get multiple identities uh, struck together. And your application just needs to consume one because you want to, you do not want to deal with all the hurdle there. Small story there, uh, even off zero, who, who knows off zero? Yeah, at least, uh, raise your hands. I, I mean, uh, obviously it's quite prominent. Otherwise, uh, if it's six and a half billion, they, they should be prominent. So identity brokering and the, the problems lying beneath there is kind of, uh, even though there is standards around like OpenID Connect, that does not mean that identity providers, uh, companies as of zero, do really 
adhere to strict standards. And so there is a lot of implementation pain going on there. I mean, Microsoft's uh, cloud login, uh, uh, login.microsoft.com, uh, uh, it's, 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 is even violating the specification as we talk right here. So it's not really well formed. So service accounts for machine to machine communication is a big thing as well today. And you want to have APIs, uh, that's the, the improved capabilities. But now, uh, with the current time, we have a big rise in, in B2B SaaS companies. So you might not only want to focus towards B2C, so like only customers, like direct customers, in a, in a matter of speaking, me, myself, and I, uh, but also you want to address companies. And that's where shit even gets harder, because you will end up with more capabilities. Uh, you need to build them at one point. It's like, oh, you want to have your customers the ability to self set up their identity provider stuff, like they have NetherAD, or the Google login, or wh whatever they want to choose, like an ADFS on prom, makes no difference. You want to have that capability. Uh, delegated identity management. Yeah, your customers should be able to create users on their own. You don't want to do anything with that, otherwise your business model will still break. I mean, it's just that. Uh, Enterprise policies, uh, if a customer does log in from IP range XYZ, you want to have the ability to say, okay, I want to have multi-factor from that IP regions, but not from that. Uh, it's, it's really, really, it gets complicated. And funny thing being, uh, branding for each business customer, maybe you have a Siemens as customer, you want to have them, their login page, appearing as Siemens, uh, even though your product looks totally different. You need to build that feature. And also, maybe uh, you have delegated access management with the crown jewel of identity and access management. Maybe you want to give your customers the ability to manage their access rights on their own. So it's kind of, you're delegating away a lot of the stuff and you need to have the data model readily available for exactly that. So what you actually end up is building a lot of the stuff out that does not directly pay into the vision your product is currently building. Yeah? And that's what, what we're trying to tell people it's really hard to figure all the capabilities out to get them stripped down and ready for prime time. And now, yeah, the nicest pass com comes around. We're not done yet. You need to operate such a system. You need to, to make sure that you have your, all your security stuff readily at hand. And I mean, hardening is just the easy part there. Yeah, you, you can do hardening, but you need to maintain a secure posture over time with such a solution. You need to mitigate OWASP top 10 risks. Right? Or who here does know what the new OWASP top 10 risk list has at number one position? Yeah, I mean, okay. <laughs> the pen tester knows it. Otherwise, I mean, Elcon guys, OWASP top 10 position, what's that? Uh, okay, I will tell you. Broken authorization, that's the biggest risk we all take nowadays. And it's important to mitigate that. And you need to build out a lot of the stuff to make that happen in a secure way. Huh? And otherwise, small things. We, we heard something like supply chain attacks here, like in the first 10 minutes, like with Log4J. It's not directly a supply chain attack, but a supply chain risk. You need to adhere to that. You need to, to have mitigations in place. And also, a lot of the other stuff. If, if you don't understand something here, just go ahead and ask me. Otherwise, I will skip the point because I, I guess I made my point. And my point is totally, don't go and build your own authentication and all authorization solution. It's, it's hideous. It won't bring you any value. That's kind of my point for the time being. So how to address it. I mean, to be honest, it's like there is one ad slide during the whole presentation. I need to tell you that because we are a company, we are an open source project, but I try to boil it down as, as friendly as it goes. So maybe you laugh at me, maybe you hate me, maybe you want to discuss it, whatever you want. Eh? What we're running is, uh, we, we call our product Citadel. Eh? I, I, I think that gets obvious here. Eh? And we think we are the culmination uh, between Off0, which is a great product, and Keycloak, which is also a great product. <laughs> but yeah, still there is an attached risk to that. And they both possess great capabilities. I mean, Off0 is just a great class, a cloud service, full-blown SaaS, 
use it, it works. Mm -hmm. Most of the times, there are nifty details, but not too cumbersome for most of us people. And Keycloak, great product to run it on-prem. But there is a combination of those two, because if you want to run something in, in today's modern landscape, uh, you maybe want to have something that's a little bit smaller than a key cloak and still open source and still runnable across multiple environments. I mean, whether you want to run it on Linux, uh, Mac OS, ARM platforms, uh, Kubernetes, uh, serverless environments running by or powered by Knative, uh, maybe some guys know Knative already. It's just we thought, okay, we can build something around that. I mean, just run an identity solution serverless with the added value of being really readily attend to do business to business problems as well. So all the problems I mentioned in the upfront statements, they are solved with our solution. Right? The, hopefully you give us a GitHub stars in the end, there is a QR code, you can Photoshop it, hopefully you do that, because Citadel is really open source. It's not like talking open source or an open core model or something like that, it's really open source. No. What makes us great, or what we think is a great enabler, not just for us, but for a lot of people, is that we are committed to three things. Eh? It's kind of, we have a public cloud. If you do not run, want to run the system on yourselves, go ahead, give us the job. We do a lot of the magic on the operational security perspective. That's why we have a lot of data and a lot of stuff going. Uh, so it's kind of low entry. You get service level agreement, whatever you want to do. But it's not a sales show, so I stop there. You can self-host it. Uh, by self-host, we mean you can use your own deployment in your own data center. We see customers running in you know, Rancho or, or whatnot. Use it. Y we can give you support if you need one, but there is the added but. There is also the open source version. You can run that on your own. It's the exactly same code as we run on open source, as we run on the self-hosted uh, and the public cloud. So we do not like, try to hide things and, and stuff there because it does not really count for the factor trust and ten transparency at that point. Yeah. So it's kind of, that's why I'm, I'm telling it, it's more or less best of both worlds because we think Keycloak with the great community is, is an impressive example, uh, impressive example of how such systems can evolve. And on the other hand, uh, a cloud service that is really well and established. So that's kind of my positioning there. And since nobody is asking questions at that point, yeah, for the upper two, there is a price tag attached, for the lower not. You raised your hand. Yeah, uh, sorry, I would like to know what is the difference with other software as a service solution, for instance, uh, AWS Cognito? So the question was, what's the difference to AWS Cognito? Well, to sum it up, I would compare AWS Cognito really closely to Auth0 with a more strict focus towards authentication and a little less authorization stuff. And uh, the biggest difference between uh, AWS Cognito and Citadel is A, we are open source, you can run us wherever you want. We do authentication and authorization. Cognito has more flexibility in regards to customizing your UI but um, less capabilities in regard to um, integration side of things like what protocols you get and what things you have available to integrate your application with based on public standards like OpenID, Connect, OAuth and SAML. That's kind of the nuance between us and them. Hopefully that answered your question or should I narrow it down a little more in, in, in a certain domain? It's okay, I, I, I did that before, like, it's fine, it's okay. <laughs> we can ask, it. we can talk about it afterwards, if you want to, if you intrigue to. Other questions? No, because Fabian will explain more towards the features we provide in, 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 in relation to um, other providers as well, because uh, as I mentioned with AWS Cognito, I mean, uh, building a business-to-business -business software with AWS Cognito is hideous because they do not provide the data model around it. They are more or less tailored towards B2C cases. But I did not want to spoil the show because yeah, there is more to talk to. Uh, and <coughs> go ahead. So the first few slides that you showed, yep. I, I had an impression, and this might be a silly question, but I, I, I got this impression that within the realm of authentication, 
Yes? Do you ever? Nope. Strictly speaking, if you, if you are talking purely authentication, what you don't do, for example, is providing app-based uh, software development kits to do things like push tarn or something like that. Uh, if, uh, if, does everybody know what push tarn is? That's what most banks do, like you get a push notification, yes, no. We don't like that. But still, you could use a, a partner company like Future Ray to do that with us, but we're not into that field. Uh, so we provide username, password, TOTP, um, U2F, FIDO2, that's kind of what we provide. It's quite much because with FIDO2 you can do a lot of things. I mean, there is a web of N for the intrigued person. Uh, and so it's not what we not provide, but we try to provide same defaults, but still you might want to use a, a specific thing for your exact case uh, where we have the ability to extend certain features within our product. Uh, but still, that's what we provide out of the box. So we, we, we think of ourselves like a turnkey solution, like a lot of things are there. You can just use it. You don't need to customize all the things because that's the value driver out of the story. But if you want to customize a lot of the things, you should talk to us if you have specific requirements because there is a dilemma in that story if we we trade customize, customizability oftentimes for security. Because if we allow, I make an example, if I allow customers to upload their own JavaScript code to a login page, it kind of breaks our risk model <laughs> on shipping a secure login page. Because there is a lot of stuff going on simply a login page, right? CSPs, AHDS, CSRF, XSS, I, I, I could keep talking only about a login page. And that's kind of where it's, it's, it's a dance between security and customization options. Yeah. So. OK. <laughs> well, so pitfalls while starting an open source project. As I already mentioned, we are an open source project, a proper open source project. And uh, what, what decision you need to make is kind of what licensing model you want to choose. Yeah? I mean, there is open core and BSL and whatnot, simply said, we took for a Apache 2, leave it like that, because we make our money not with the code, we make our money with our experience and with the service we can provide on top. That's kind of what we think of that. And that's more or less close to what Red Hat does with Keycloak. There are some minor details on how we progress, because Red Hat has a closed source version of Keycloak. We do not have a closed source version of uh, Citadel. It's just there, purely. How do you know monetize? Big, big, big question there is, are you an open source community building a product or are you a company who has an open source product? I mean, that's, that's a difference because with us, it's not the community who shapes the direction, it's the company who shapes the direction, but we accept contributors. So it's kind of the other way around. So for all of you guys who are known to, to Kubernetes, yeah, it's not like there is a steering committee and a lot of people talking about what Kubernetes is and how complex it should be evolving. It's just we as company shape the product and we allow other people to improve it and to use it as well. Yeah, yeah and then creating a community is kind of the hardest thing, actually, <laughs> if I'm needing to be honest, because, um, yeah, it's just hard. <laughs> Let me talk about that in another talk. It's just great. And uh, also tricky is uh, creating a great user experience, being either for your end users or for users of your project, like people who want to contribute. It's hard to get them engaged easily because it's not like they're reading through tons and tons of documentation. It needs to be like concise, one page. Otherwise, nobody reads it, nobody cares. And that's kind of the problem being there. Okay, so now my better part can talk for a moment <laughs> and I can Thanks. rest in the data size and thank you. So yes, um, what features do you help um, to build your projects? Um, as Florian already mentioned, uh, we are kind of building for the B2B part. Um, like if you already know of zero, they are mostly in the B2C section, 
um, they kind of shipped some features, I think, last year. Uh, but before, there were, there were almost no identity and access management solutions which are built for the B2B section. So, and we kind of come from the government part. So there you have like all the, the cantons and the communities and they need to um, switch between all the, the, these parts and somehow they need to manage something in there and somehow somewhere there. So that is the same like in all the companies. Like you have your own organization and you are the service provider. You make your application and now you have some uh, customers and that are other businesses. So um, you get a second organization where all the users are um, for this company, for your customer. And then you uh, create your project, for example, your application, and you provide this to your customer. So from this part, they are able to self-manage everything they need to. And that's something we think is really important. Um, so if you want to um, grow, you're not able to manage everything for all of your customers. So you want that they can create all their users. They can create all the authorizations for their users. They want to connect, for example, with Google Workspace or they want to connect the Azure AD. So everything they want to like to connect, they want to do by themselves. Florian already talked about branding. Um, they want their logo on the login page. They want um, to force multi-factor, but your other customer doesn't want to. So you need to configure everything for each of your customers. And that's something you don't want to do. So that's the one part like we do for you and you just create your application, give it to your customer. And from this point, they will be able to do everything by themselves. Identity brokering is like the next biggest thing. Um, you have like multiple applications. You have multiple providers from Azure AD, Okta, um, GitHub, and you actually don't care um, where the users from your uh, customers come. And we connect everything together. So Florian already talked about OIDC. That's the standard we have at the moment. SAML is the next one we will provide. And that's something you don't want to care about. Um, so we build it for you and you can use whatever you want. Connect each application and you don't care what kind of standards they have. Um, we already hear a lot of from our customers like they started building and they started uh, implementing uh, authorization by themselves. And then, then they realized, okay, my next customer said uh, they want to have multi-factor, but at the moment I only have like password um, for the login. And then you say, okay, I will do multi-factor with uh, an SMS, for example. And then the next customer is coming to you and says, okay, but I want OTP. Then you're saying like, okay, I do the next one. And this goes on and on. And after a lot of uh, requirements, you realize, oh God, why didn't I choose a solution I already um, could buy and I did this by myself because the customers always want more and more requirements and you can't uh, focus on all this stuff if you want to run your own application. Um, and you can see like in the part on the right we have, it should show like a, an access lock. Um, Citadel has kind of uh, in context audit well. Um, Citadel is based on event sourcing. I don't know who knows about event sourcing. Okay, some, yeah, some of them. The most identity and access management solutions are not based on uh, event sourcing. So they just have like their objects, um, a user, an authorization, an organization, whatever you need. And then next to it, this, uh, they will have a log where you can see what happened. And that's kind of something you're never sure if everything was locked or not. And you not completely sure um, if you know everything that happened in your system. So that's something why we choose event sourcing as our um, base of the solution. So um, everything that happens is in an event and out of this we build all the objects we need um, in our solution. So you can see everything that happened. If I changed a user, if I changed my password, like this is just 
the store we need um, to have all the data in Citadel. Um, this gives us some um, great features for the future, like um, we store all the data back to when we started, and in the future we can do some uh, machine learning on this data and find out um, or train models about what happened. Um, we can even travel back in time, so if you had a, a mistake like two weeks ago and do you want to find out what was the data at this time. So we just can go back in the time to, to see, okay, what, what happened from that point um, to now to recognize um, what happened in the system. Um, we say like Citadel is built for devs and CISOs and that's like two completely different um, focus groups. And why is that? Like we think developers and CISOs have a completely different um, needs. Uh, like developers, they just don't care about authorization and um, authentication. They just want to build their business. Um, but they need it. So they want to integrate within five minutes. So I want to start, I don't care if it's a SaaS service or an open source service and I run it locally. I just want to start in five minutes and then I want to integrate and I'm done. And hopefully this is really secure. And I don't care about the B2B stuff, all my customers. I don't want to build a branding for each of them because this is just too much work for me and I'm really lazy. On the other side, you have all the CISOs and they just have kind of a checklist they go through and want to tick all the boxes. And if that's uh, done, they are fine with this. And this is kind of like the audit trail they want to have. They want, for example, data location guarantees. So we are all in living in Switzerland and most of, or you have a lot of companies, they say like, I only want my data in Switzerland and you have to care about how this happens. And this is something that CISO looks for, but the developer just doesn't care. And then most of the part is like, developers are the ones who integrate and they mostly don't have the credit card of the company. But the CISOs will have. So, and these are the ones who make the decision. So the developer just integrates, he wants to build great stuff, he wants to um, do authentication and login, and if he sees a product he really likes, he's happy. And then he will go to the CISO and say, okay, uh, but now I will need the credit card because this great product is in my service and you just need to put it through so I can work with this. And this is kind of the part, developers are the one who integrate, so we want to be open source, build our community, so they will talk about it and recommend it. And on the other hand, if the CISO comes after and he wants to tick his boxes, we just need to focus on this part as well. So we don't have some parts where he says, no, this is a solution I can't use. So yeah, that's actually um, almost everything. Like Florian already said, we are kind of a small project right now. Um, comparing to America. In Switzerland, like uh, GitHub stars um, are not that big like in America. Um, so if you would give us a, a GitHub star, we really uh, appreciate this. And yeah, if you need any of our contact data, we have also a Discord channel. If you just want to chat with us and find out something else, just um, yeah, write us. Do you have any questions? Yeah? Uh, I think that you are using database to get uh, an insertion. Uh, could I provide like a private, the board for a private key? Because I guess we are doing some encryption in country. So how, how do you manage the integration with the board, with private and public key for that? Should I answer that? Give me the mic, just for the online audit. So the question was, how do we integrate with externally supplied secrets, if I'm understanding correctly? Like, for example, through a solution like HashiCorp Vault. Yeah. Okay, good. So <coughs> Citadel is built around the idea of being a self-contained Go binary, 
And ba what basically happens is all the necessary key material to start Citadel is being supplied through uh, an external source, like a config map and secret if you're talking Kubernetes. And you could substitute that secret of any source you wish. So it's kind of easy to use um, um, a HashiCorp vault uh, sidecar or in init container to just get that secret into Citadel and then it runs on its own. Um, what I need to mention there is secrets who are vitally for Citadel's operation, like signing keys, for example, will only be stored within our database's reach. Because from an availability perspective, we think of our database is more available, 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 available <laughs> than HashiCorp Vault under normal circumstances. And not because HashiCorp Vault is an um, unavailable solution, but due to the focus of an identity and access management system of the necessity of being available all the time, we took some precautions on how we think the database should operate. So to, to keep it simple, like encryption keys for the keys we use as system should be supplied externally, but still Citadel will generate some of the secrets on its own, like um, signing keys for JSON web tokens and or SAML, for example. Does that answer? Yeah. Great. Other questions? I mean, there is kind of like, is it like seven minutes left or something? Yeah. Are we ahead of time? That's unusual <laughs> for me. <laughs> That's a, a first. <laughs> it's definitely a first. Raise your hands. Go ahead. If I may. Yeah, just go ahead. Crazy question. Yes. So as far as I'm seeing here, Citadel is really nice when it comes to web applications. Like you open a web page, you have some login, you do whatever. You will yes. Have Yes, you can. <laughs> there is even uh, on our docs page, like docs.citadel.ch, there is a guide for MongoDB Atlas, if I remember incorrectly, because you can plug in their JOT provider. And yeah, Citadel can provide the access token in a JOT format if you configure it that way. By default, we will provide opaque tokens. But yes, you can. I mean, even uh, CockroachDB, our uh, database of choice is CockroachDB. And uh, CockroachDB also allows for um, OpenID Connect as, authentic as means of authentication. But to be honest, I think under normal operations, the data layer should always be hidden behind some kind of business logic. But simply said, yes, <laughs> if the database supports it. <laughs> That's the concise answer, hopefully. Yes? Yes. And um, there is a, a huge gap between when you own GUI, which probably is an approach as you have APIs for everything, and providing just simple branding where you can say, well, replace that image, it will replace that. But um, mostly the customers want something in between. So yep. where they kind of can integrate their look and feel of their application and so on. <laughs> How do you solve that? Or have you already solved that? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. I mean, the question was, can Citadel address all the customization needs, especially of business customers, I would, uh, if I understand correctly? The answer being yes to a 70 to 80 percent degree. Like, okay, Citadel out of right of the box can do things like you can upload logos, fonts, you can customize any text. Uh, you can ask, customize uh, all the colors, like all the colors, just four colors, but still all the colors. And th that gives much of the flexibility needed for most of the customers. Although there might be corner cases where I agree, where customers want to have their own login flow and stuff, that's where we currently, like talking today, are not totally into because it, it kind of breaks our risk assumption on providing a secure login page. But later, to the, later this year, <laughs> we, we will take a route in regard to allow customers to upload their own code 
to create custom login pages and stuff like really custom but that pushes kind of a lot of the security problems towards the customer so it, it needs to be another customer at that point and so I would argue at that point 80% of the cases we can solve out of the box 20% will be solvable end of this year but that 20% is just hideous to solve because your risk model will just blow away. Like, I mean, running external code within your solution is kind of a, a deal taker. <laughs> Hopefully that answers it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's like we have still some minutes left. Go ahead. O otherwise, there is beer, there is Coke, there is the whatever. Is and the pizza is coming, it, it, it's being stated here. So. Feel at liberty to talk with us afterwards, where we, we feel encouraged, and we also really encourage you to provide us like uh, feedbacks and visions and ideas. And if you don't want to provide them in person, uh, there is the Discord, there is GitHub. Engage with whatever means feels fine for you. But in the end, <laughs> I don't want to see any more key cloaks around. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I, I needed to ditch Red Hat at that point, but I don't like key cloak. I honestly don't like it. We can <laughs> fair point, fair point. I, I guess that's fine so close. <laughs> so. Thank you all for joining us. Um, as mentioned, the drinks are here. Uh, pizza will be here soon. Um, thank you all who joined online. Um, if you have any inputs to give, uh, um, also you can leave a comment down below. Um, and also for the people here, I brought some stickers, some Lego figurines, and some vouchers for free Apoyo Cloud accounts if you want. Uh, go grab them over there, but there's a yellow container. Um, and if you want to, you know, bring some stickers or uh, swag next time, please do so. Um, there's like a sticker exchange, um, except I guess I'm the only one that brought some. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you for being here. If, uh, if you have ideas for a talk or if you want to sponsor the meetup uh, with a location, uh, please uh, get in touch with us through the meetup group. There's a link there to a form. Um, and we're, of course, happy to make this a community event as it's driven by all of us. Thank you.